Yeah, well. I, I think after that, that is another issue that's often overlooked. Mm. OK, um, well, thanks for joining me, Dick, today. Um, what was preparing for this podcast, I, I thought I'd research what some notable artists had to say about art and the making of. And I found that, of course, those who lived and worked prior to the digital age didn't really mention or, or in fact, point toward the manual process in and of itself. Um, even multimedia artists such as Matisse, first with his paintings and later his stained glass and series of cutouts, and, and also Andy Warhol, who was arguably a precursor to the automated age of art, they, they both neglected to comment, as far as I could find, on the relationship between the, the tools and the artists being symbiotic. I found there was plenty of commentary around technique, um, but to my mind, technique comes comes after the conjoining of tools and hands. So I think that the 21st century artists are in a kind of new territory, which is why these conversations are, are so important. Another thing that I discovered whilst I was putting my mind to this issue as I, I flicked through the books on my quite meagre art shelf was when gazing at those images, I, I found that I didn't really fully understand the, the meaning of each piece. It was if, um, as if the artist could only like, partially articulate his intentions to me. Certainly all the pieces that I, that I really liked the most gave off this kind of enigmatic signal um, and whether that emanated from the form or, or medium, colour, texture, whatever. <laughs> And this got me thinking about the level of association between mind, eye, hand and, and tool, which, of course, is like, like a coordination that occurs before the art, before the art emerges. And I had this thought um, that l the layering of the human application must be something to do with the wonder of the finished piece um, in that we recognise beauty not only in its presentation, but also in its production. So I wanted to ask you, Dick, do you think that the comparative ease of digital art conflates those layers of human application and and hence undermines the wonder of the finished piece um I, I can't really do anything but agree with you on that yes i think that's absolutely the case um i think because art has become so democratized anyone can anyone can take part in it now uh, Photoshop itself used to be a, a mystery to most people. When I started doing it for a living, it, it was quite a set of skills to acquire and get good at. But mm -hmm. as the uh, the software itself became more and more accessible, it became easier and easier. Uh, you're also into a world where everyone's a photographer now. Everyone with a telephone is mm -hmm. a photographer by default. Um, and image manipulation is second nature to, to the youth today then yes all of these skills have become devalued so everyone but everyone can do digital art to some degree so really good digital art is going to have to stand out a lot stronger from that whereas the old skills of painting illustrating um, woodcuts uh, printmaking sculpture all the traditional fine art that it, it's still quite a reserved skill there's still a fair few people who can do it but yeah digital art is just omnipresent yeah completely devalued yeah um and is digital art any more than just being good with a computer do you think absolutely yes i think artists who have who will ultimately be able to turn their hand to any medium. And you talked about Matisse and uh, his ability uh, as a multimedia practitioner. I think a, a lot of artists, not all, can pretty much turn their hand at anything and do something amazing. David Hockney was very quick to adopt the iPad a, as a as a medium. Yeah. I think he, he kind of loved it and he did some interesting and new things with it. I wasn't particularly fond of them. I prefer <laughs> his old stuff. But um if an artist turns his hand to new medium, it should still be good art. Um, the, the, the problem is, if you're not skilled, it won't make you a good artist. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it reminds me or makes me think of Grayson Perry, and who is obviously a very hands on artist being a potter, but also now um, plans his tapestries out on a, on, you know, digitally on, on an iPad or whatever. He uses um have you seen uh, those tapestries um in yeah. the flesh they're, yeah they're, they're stunning they're amazing pieces of work and i think part of 
what you get from looking at art and i'm talking about going into an art gallery and looking at art rather than seeing it online or on tv or in a book um actually being up close to the actual work is you should be questioning wow how did he do that how was that done and obviously with an old tapestry you know that it's it's a lot of hard work and hand stitching but with these apparently it's all computer generated and programmed but i, I think that's you know, almost as laudable in that it's an amazing new way of producing art. And uh, to some degree, the art is in the making uh, in Grace and Perry's tapestries. But they are the finished result is, is a stunning visual effect and something that, you, that most people won't have seen before. No. Um, so did, did Grayson make tapestries previous to um, using the digital format? I don't know if he did. I, I'd like to know more about it. And that yeah. was one of the questions I was asking. I, w I went to see the, the show when uh, it was um, on locally at Croom Court. Um, my wife dragged me along. I wasn't that keen to see them, but I'm so glad she did because, uh, you know, they were, that they were sold at well it's the modern version of the rake's progress isn't it the sort yes of, it the, is the uh the hogarth thing which I, i'd always loved when I studied history of art at school um i loved that uh history i'm um, sorry art as a storytelling medium and uh the the amount of things going on in each painting or engraving and uh uh, even now, I can I, I can tell a um, a friend that, that the story of what's going on in each of the paintings and point point to the little details and uh, um, they are fantastic works and it's lovely that that tradition has been carried on. And I think Grayson Perry is an odd one for the fact that he seems to revel in the in, in the fact that the art for all type approach uh, because he's had he's got his own TV show now, hasn't he? In which mm. uh, um, people submit their art to him and uh, um, he, he's an odd one for the fact that he is very much in that camp but also he is undeniably skilled um, and he's a bit of a media player as well so uh, much as I would love to hate him I can't help liking him. No me too me too I actually um, lived with his brother in Australia. No and, way. Yeah and Mr. Mr. Lunch with Grayson um, by a, a, a bus, I, the, the bus didn't come, so I didn't turn up for the lunch. Gosh, yeah. how annoying! Yeah, gutted about that because he seems like a really interesting chap. Oh, un uh, undoubtedly, yes. He just won the Tate as well, so um, he just won the um, um, sorry, what's that prize? The Turner Prize. Yeah, beg your pardon, the Turner Prize. Yeah, right. That was just just after that, so that would have been a good chap. And never mind. Um, so do do you think that there's something in if we could just talk about sort of what Grayson's done for a moment, that he decided that he wanted to expedite the work. He had the image in his mind. He knew what he wanted to do. He knew he wanted to be a tapestry. And rather than do the, the laborious old way, he just thought, I, I, I want to make this art so I can get on to do other things. Uh, or do you think he or people like Grayson who prefer digital art just want to be expeditions and just just wanted the easy way to do it well it's nothing new to um come up with the idea and have someone else execute it all the great masters of the renaissance had uh, a lot of assistants doing their various uh, um bits for them i mean um who, who was it, it was, uh, one of the famous masters you can still see some of the putty he you know the little angels he's painted in in his master's paintings i'm going to get the name wrong so i'm not going to say it but it is one of the renaissance greats and um they you know they had studios full of of, of assistants doing their paintings for them similarly with with tapestries it mm. wouldn't have been the work of one person there would have been an artistic director of sorts overseeing the whole thing and i should imagine there's a room full of um of nimble fingered ladies stitching away at these things so yeah it, it's nothing new Andy Warhol you mentioned earlier yeah. he, he had a whole factory doing uh, doing his bidding and I dare say he, he, he flounced in at the last moment and, and signed them but uh, it doesn't make it any less that artist's work because it's his vision that's gone through so yes he there's no way Grace and Perry could have achieved those uh, tapestries any other way in the modern world if he didn't want to be doing them for the rest of his life so yeah it, I, I, I am fine with this uh, this way of working 
it's not for everyone, but uh, um, for what he wanted to achieve, he, he did it. So, I mean, Damien Hurst did that as well, didn't he? Famously with his, I think it was his dots, whatever you want to call them. Um, he had people churning them out and making a lot of money off of them. Um, do you have any prints? Are you into prints or do you like originals? To hang um, in your house? It's a good question because uh, up until up until relatively recently, I was doing large canvases. It was something I'd done all the way through art college. I, I did, uh, did five years of art college, um, a foundation course, three years of a degree, and then a one-year MA. And I never quite got past large oil on canvas because I, I just felt that's what artists did. And it wasn't until years later, my friend Jonathan Miles Lee, who has recently been doing podcasts with with my brother, uh, some fantastic podcasts, which I urge everyone to to check out and listen to. Jonathan said, you know, what you need to be doing is selling prints. You'll never make money out of just selling a, a, a big canvas. And uh, certainly with my canvases, you wouldn't have wanted to buy them anyway. They're a weird subject matter that was mostly quite personal to me, suitable only really for showing but not selling. Uh, I didn't need to sell my art because uh, I, I would I'd already drifted over towards um, graphic design and I was earning a living as a graphic designer. So the painting was kind of just a hobby. But I started doing smaller paintings in watercolor. So that's two big jumps going small and changing medium um, to a stage where I could easily get the paintings professionally scanned and have gicle prints made. So there were very, very high quality prints which were costing me about £25 a pop, which I could then sell. Um, and it was an absolute eye-opener. I, I could sell the paint, sell the prints and even do postcards, and I, I even moved into making them into cigarette cards, which have been very successful. And I've kept all the originals. So I hold the original watercolours while I've, I've made a fair bit of money on selling selling the prints, which I can continue to do so uh, ad nauseum. So... Uh, mm. Yes, it, it's 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 been a huge breakthrough to me. Um, I, I I I can't see myself ever going back to doing big oils. It's uh, it, it's a wonderful way of working. Okay. Um, in your experience as a commercial artist, do you think there's a type of person that has no problem with having a, a print on their wall, and a type of person that really would like um, their house full of originals or a mix? Um, type of customer. It, it's it's a tough one because I'm because I'm not offering the originals. I mean, I have had some um, commissions recently. People seeing what I do, and effectively, what I'm now doing is doing illustrations of military uniforms. It's it's a very very niche area, but I've had people approaching me asking me to do uh, a portrait of their son in his army uniform and, and the things like that. And so I've done them as one offs. Obviously, there was never any intention there to to do a print and they wouldn't have been happy with the print. They want an original piece of their son, which uh, obviously is going to cost a fair bit more than a print. But I think people still understand that there is a value in that original, that they've got the piece of paper in front of them that has brush strokes on it you can see where the the paint has sunk into the the texture of the paper um you're, you're holding the one and only example of that piece of art there's still something about that that uh, a, an original piece of art is very important to that person in a way that a print simply wouldn't be no matter how good it is so uh you know this will be another reason why digital art will never completely have one over on traditional art because people do appreciate looking at something that represents the skill of a craftsman yeah and if you just while you were saying that i was imagining what i have moved into a new house and having bare walls at the moment all the art that i've got i've put into the downstairs toilet all over the walls i thought well that's my history that can be a bit of a museum of my past life and then the rest of the house i'll start anew um, and I've been looking at original pieces, but hearing you talk about it then, if if you uh, like the work of the artist, especially if they're still living and you want to support them, um, then why not buy a print? Yes, you're not getting the original piece, but if it's just a one off, then that artist that you that you like so much has only made one lot of bunts out of it, you know, and perhaps could, could do with 
could do with a bit more money. I think you've got to go with what the artist wants to do. I mean, in my case, I don't particularly want to sell the originals of of the uniform collection. I've, I've still got all the originals in a portfolio, and it's quite a satisfying thing to have them. Um, and as you say, w- w- once you sell the original, it's gone forever, and you're you're back to doing another. It's a tricky one with art and artists getting getting precious. You you mustn't love your things so much that you don't want to sell them otherwise you're not really an artist it's uh um you you've got to you've got to let your children go um but if you are an artist who's just existing on prints then yeah but buy a print from that artist but i was thinking about this earlier today about what people do about their empty homes and their walls and some people are just happy to go along and They'll be wandering down an aisle in home base that might have some ghastly pre-printed canvases and they'll just shove a couple of those into their trolley without really considering the content of them. And uh, and that'll go up on the wall. And essentially, it's just a splash of color on their wall. So I don't know how much how much people think about what that art is. I mean, fair enough. Some people might really love those paintings uh, or those prints, but does everyone give their art that much consideration i'm not sure they do no i think you're right i i I know hardly anybody that in my world that gives the art on their walls much consideration and the people that i do know give it a great deal of consideration Mm. it seems to be one or the other they you don't really dabble um have you heard of uh, a chap called ed i'm gonna i'm gonna bugger up the pronunciation of his surname ed rusha R-U-S-C-H-A, I think it is. Uh, I'm writing that down. Uh, no. He um, he brought out this book, which is it's dribbles of like organic material on paper, page by page, with an index of, of what the original material was. And some of, some of the things that what did he milk onto the page, things like um, turnip, egg yolk, I think he had red cabbage, parsley, ketchup, I think, coffee, you know, loads of stuff like that um, now that piece of work regardless of you if you think it's good art or not just could not be imagined into existence via digital means you know and it, that could be a case that illustrates a limitation for, for digital art again um maybe he's moved towards that for that very reason it's like in a world where you can actually email someone the commission that you've just done for them and they can then put it on a disc and take it to a local printer and then that can be printed and that can be put in a frame by someone else and you can there's no connection then between the artist and the person who's putting it on their walls despite the transaction having having taken place it it, it may i don't know much about this ed rusher guy but it might be an attempt at, at doing that saying no that this one specifically has to be uh um a, a one-off but that yeah. that's kind of what um um damien hurst was doing with his drip paintings and what have you it was a, a, a way of almost mass producing i mean they're all they're all originals they're all unique but uh um is that the one he set up on the spindle when he would yeah. spin it around yeah that's right. I mean, you you can do those at, at fairgrounds. Um, I, I did one on a trip to Berlin years and years ago, and um, you've got these quick drying paints and a spinning disc thing, and uh, you you pay your Deutschmarks and you have a go, and you end up with a a spinny drip painting. And it's um, Damien Hirst being obviously knowingly cynical about the easy come, easy go nature of this and knowing that if it's got his name attached to it, it, it he's quids in. He, he's a businessman. Um, in a way, he's the Phil Collins of the of the art world. Remember when Phil Collins was um, officially Britain's top businessman? which I thought was hilarious. There's a guy who would have considered himself first and foremost a musician, and yet he was so canny with the way he managed the finances around his uh, uh, his music that he, by default, became a top businessman. And I think this is what Damien Hurst has done. You can't help but admire him for it, but uh, it, it does deconstruct the starving artist um, cliche, doesn't it? It does. It, it, it obliterates it. I remember... Um, that, that did happen to Phil Collins and he was well known um, for, for, for being very wealthy out of what, what he did and, uh, and a great businessman and it resulted in, in when Noel Gallagher and Liam Gallagher come along Noel Gallagher said I won't be happy until um, 
I've got Phil Collins heading a pole, at, you know, at the end of the decade. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a very Gallagher way of uh, putting it. But you, yeah. you can see what he's saying. I don't think there's a particular amount of malice. Or no, not at all. But I mean, Phil Collins was uh, was the it was an easy target. He opened himself up for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, but look who's laughing. It's 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 not it's not uh, not us. It's yeah, us. absolutely, absolutely. Um, do, your history with with making art. I mean, do you, do you make figurines, military figurines and figures? Um, I, I you, like war gaming figures. Yeah, you mean? Yeah, I mean, I ha- I have painted them a fair bit but I, I didn't really see that as as being part of my artistic life it, there's kind of two strands of my life that have come together in my paintings one is that 20 years ago when I left London and moved here to Worcester where I am now I I went to see a, a reenactment of the Battle of Worcester which was 1651. Uh, it was the battle that ended the English Civil War. So, you know, Worcester is an English Civil War town. It's famous for it. Um, and so I was drawn to the history of the place. And I went to see this reenactment by the sealed knot, you know, pikes and muskets, roundheads and cavaliers and all that. And I, I thought, oh, this is all quite spectacular, but it looks like a heck of a lot of fun on the field, more so than being in the audience. And so I I joined up and I became a member of the Sealed Knot. And 20 years on, my whole life has revolved around reenactment. I, I've been doing Napoleonic reenactment and World War One and World War Two. I've I've thrown myself into it, head and shoulders. And it's uh, it's had an effect on my art in that um, I suddenly had a subject matter I really wanted to paint. Um, and the wargaming part of things, to get back to you after this long rambling deviation, uh, okay. wargaming war is, you know, goes hand in hand with reenactment. A lot of reenactors like their military wargaming. And wargaming itself splits into two parties, one who, side who just like to paint the figures and the other side who just like to do the gaming part of things and the rolling of the dice and the measuring and the um, you know, line of sight, hiding your figures behind walls and that, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's not often you find people who love to do both equally. There's the gamers and there's the painters. So I, I liked painting a fair bit and I tried my hand at war gaming. Again, it, it's not key to my art, but what was key to it was deciding I was going to do these front and back portraits, which is what my website is full of now. Yeah. It's, um, I, I've got about 40 in the series now, but going through history, everything from Romans right the way through to a, a 1980s SAS soldier. Uh, I do the, the front of the soldier and the back of the soldier to show all the equipment on their back. And although... Really, they are illustrations rather than fine art. Um, I, I, I like to think there's a sort of fine art element to them. Um, so, yeah, that's my art. Painting little soldiers isn't, but the two are quite closely linked. Um, so do you, would you call yourself a draftsman or a, as well as a as well as an artist, like um, close precision work? Um, draftsman is not a term I've ever really used to myself. I mean, I, I, I have, I have often agonized over the difference between an illustrator and, uh, a, an artist. And there's, you can take that even further because I, I, I earn my living a, as a graphic designer, but really that ends the moment I, I leave work and come home. I, I, it, it's something that does nothing for my soul, but the art side of things really does. Now, an illustrator, the way I've got it planned out in my mind, is an artist that works to uh, a commission, works to uh, instructions from a client. So they want something quite specific. And the illustrator, although they will inevitably inject their own style into it, they are not choosing what they do. An artist is going to be all out coming up with the concept, coming up with the medium, coming up with the style. Um, it is completely their own thing. An illustrator is working to a brief and a graphic designer, even further away, it, it, it's just practical art. It may be advertising, it may be uh, 
typesetting or what have you, all the stuff that I do for a living. So you've got those three things. Uh, the, on the, the, the least um, traditionally artistic is the graphic designer. The, uh, the most is the artist. And in between those two is the illustrator. And I would say my stuff is illustrational, but it's still me. It's still fine art. It's still 100 percent my decision. What goes where? and um, what happens with the end result. Um, talking about digital art and um, it, the comparative, comparative ease of, of making it, have you got lots of experience with making mistakes in, in your work and, and having to go over it and start again and rub things out and clear things off um, and rather than just press the um, re uh, undo button? It's a, it's a funny thing, isn't it? We're, we're all so used to um, digital medium that when, you, when you're given a picture in a book and you want to look closer, have you ever gone up to it and tried to pinch your fingers apart to try and expand it on the page? It, it's sort of sometimes we forget we're looking at real things. And uh, I, I've done that a few times and um, I found, found myself really embarrassed at what I was doing. But yes, uh, that the... the uh, Wanting there to be a, a, a command Z to undo when you're actually doing a proper painting. Uh, again, it's why proper art is separate to digital art. There is no undo uh, in, in painting. Now, with oil painting, it's, it's quite a forgiving medium. You can you can scrape it off with a palette knife and start again. You, you can uh, paint over it when it's dry. Watercolor can be quite unforgiving in that respect. So um, you, if you put if you put some color down you and it's wrong or it seeps into an area it shouldn't be, to, a, to some degree you can dab back into it w w with water and work it back and lift it off with a tissue. You'll never get completely white paper again. Um, and the idea with good watercolor is you, you're not using white the the white is always the white of the paper so that's a challenge in itself but that's part of your skill is to uh, every bit that's white it's the bits that you haven't painted over so yeah it's, it's a good point you there is no undo there is no automatic masking all the uh, the features at your disposal in digital art are, are not available to you per se in in painting but there are things like masking out fluid. There's mm. techniques like using an atomizer. Uh, th there's lots of tricks that artists have used traditionally. You know, simple ones like using a toothbrush to to flick um, partially dried paint over the surface for a splatter effect. You'd actually be quite hard pushed to recreate that digitally. So there's things that are very, uh, very much more hands on, on in traditional painting that uh, that I struggle to reproduce when I'm doing digital art. And what would then be um, your preferred pieces that you've made, the pieces that you've sailed through, not a problem, every decision you made during the process you, you found was correct, you applied the techniques to the best of your abilities and, and it all went hunky-dory, all the ones where you've had to mess about, go back and it's been a bit of a journey. Yeah, the, the, the sort of hard one thing, it, you know, it's... <laughs> The, the painting that immediately springs to mind is the one I've currently got over my fireplace. Uh, I even had it framed by a, a professional framer at the cost of about six hundred pounds. It looks great. It took me a year to paint. Um, I, I clocked my hours because I always methodically keep a, a I do a tick mark in the margin every time I've done an hour's painting, just so when people say, oh, that's good. How long did that take? I can actually give them an answer. And this one was two hundred and forty hours. Now, it was a. It was a painting uh, from a photo I took with my iPhone about 10 years ago of my daughter and her friend in a record shop in um, Totnes in Devon. And I was outside and I looked in, the girls were flicking through the, the covers and there was records everywhere. And I thought, that makes a good photo. So I, I took a photo. And when I uh, uploaded it, when I got home, I found there was a reflection in the window of me taking the photo you could see the pub opposite reflected in the glass of the uh, of the shop and and yet you could still see through into the shop it was very very complex and i i looked at it and i thought only a madman would ever try to paint that <laughs> and 
over the next few days, that thought sort of grew in my mind. It said, yeah, but it would make a good painting, wouldn't it? Oh, it would look amazing. And I thought, but what's the point of just painting something that's already there in a photo? And um, this probably comes to the crux of the, of the whole question of this podcast. Why would I want to do a painting that essentially was bringing nothing more to the table than recreating what was done in that photo? And yet I've elevated that photo I took to, uh, I think it's about you know, um, two and a half foot by three and a half foot painting in oils that took 240 hours of my life to, to do. And I've meticulously, with a tiny brush, painted every millimeter of, of that photo, uh, including the reflection of me taking the photo. So I'm not even trying to deny that this is a painting of a photo because you can see a reflection of me holding an iPhone in it. Um, but I, I absolutely love that painting. I'm so proud of it. I could never sell it. Um, so it, it serves no other purpose than to make me happy and to, you know, for me to proudly show off my work to people. So it's an odd one. I have made a few decisions within the painting that were beyond the photo. For instance, um, some of the verticals in it would have been slightly wonky in the photo. So I've straightened up um, the, the, the struts that were in the windows and I, I've, I've rearranged things ever so slightly to make a more satisfying painting. But this is the thing that an artist is doing. Even if you're copying a painting, you are not going to make the same painting that another artist would make from that photo. It's always going to be slightly different. Even if you tried not to show your hand, it's still going to look like a Dick Dellingpole painting rather than one done by someone else. So, um, you know, I, 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 on the one level, I am just a copyist. But on another level, I'm still uh, the painter Dick Dellingpole. Yeah. And if, if we can quantify the, the value of your experience with that particular piece, I mean, the photo in and of itself that you you explained to me probably isn't worthy of a conversation without then what came afterwards with your decision to to paint that you know even however good the photo would have been you probably wouldn't say oh I took this photo the other day it was of such and such if you hadn't sort of elongated that journey with with the painting itself do you think yeah absolutely and uh you'd be <laughs> you'd be surprised how many artists rely heavily on on photos i mean i was i was looking into how some of the uh the more accomplished military artists uh, achieve their amazing paintings i mean if you if you're doing military paintings especially historical ones you've got to get the detail right you've got to make sure the uniform was correct for the battle that you're painting or uh, uh, and so forth you've got to make sure the guns are being fired correctly you've got to have a lot of knowledge to go into a paint a military painting um of a particular era and i was looking at the the work of this uh, of an artist called don troiani who is one of the most famous american um, art, his, um, military history painters. He's still working. Um, and a, a friend in America sent me a book of his work. And in between the plates of like, you know, various American Civil War battles, which are spectacular, he's got a few little photos of reenactors that he has posed in various positions. And some of them are just guys in uniform in a car park, you know, pretending to lie dead and things like that. And it, sure enough, he's done exactly what I would have done. He's posed people in uniforms, in positions, and he's photographed them and he's brought them into his, brought the photos into his studio and he's worked them into the canvas. And when he needs to a, a particular model for a particular area, he, he, he grabs a friend, grabs the uniform, dresses them up, poses them. Uh, you know, they, they're not doing this from their head. Uh, that they're, they're not they're not so good that they can imagine what these various soldiers look like in their various positions and what the pack on their back is doing at that particular point. These are very, very difficult things. You know, the, the way a, a soldier holds a musket while he fires it. What, what are his feet doing? Are they apart? Are they together? Um, in different periods of history, they would um, be firing in a very different style. There's so much you can do wrong. And so yeah. I've not only got to consider um, whether the painting is good or not, whether the, the head is in proportion to the body is in proportion to the gun, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I've got to make sure they're historically accurate and that the, the reenactor I photographed to do the painting from is getting it right in the first place, because uh, 
my audience is very quick to point out, oh, that that gun didn't come in until at least four years after you're claiming that painting is is based. You know, I don't want to be caught out like that. And uh, that, that that's another consideration with with, with what I do. Well, it's um, it's like manual art is a is a tightrope and digital art is more of a bridge, you know, to get from one the, the beginning of thinking about the piece to actually finishing it. And there seems to be far more landmines involved in in the manual process than there ever could be in the digital process. Yeah, and uh, it's also the appreciation you get at the end of it. I've um, I've, I've got a uh, a, a close friend who has um, moved almost solely now into digital art and I can't help feeling that although the skill he applies to the digital art he, he works with a, a graphics tablet and a stylus and um, sometimes he can just use his finger on the graphics tablet uh, and what he's doing is amazing but he won't get as much appreciation because it's digital uh, even though the same amount of skill has gone into it, the, the general audience will say, yeah, yeah, but it, it, it's digital. Therefore, it's been made easy for you. And that might not necessarily be the case. You you might be actually making life more difficult for yourself by doing it digitally. Um, but but it, it it seems to, certainly to me, it seems to devalue it, especially mm. if you can print off endless amount of of copies at the end of it. There is no single original piece. The original piece in a piece of digital art that was made on a computer is, in its essence, just a bunch of zeros and ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, this brings me to mind to mind something that I wanted to ask you about, and that's and that's about sort of writing. I was in a previous podcast with Carbon, uh, Carbon Mike. Him and I were talking about the experience of being wrong. And I'm kind of focused in on this experience. I think it's it's one that undeniably follows a person throughout their life. And keeping that in mind has, has helped me constantly check my own thinking. So it brought me to observe something um, whilst I was mulling over the topic we're exploring today. And that's as strongly as I feel about um, maintaining manual artistic practices rather than computer aided artwork. I do, however, see a possible hole in, in my logic when I equate um, painting, drawing, sculpture, collage, etc., with writing, which is something that I do often, and I hardly ever do it without the assistance of a computer. Now, most of my favourite writers are, are dead, and their manuscripts were, were formed with either a pen or a pencil or, or a typewriter. And although I, I learned to write long form with a pen, I'm almost positive that I would not have the mental capacity to edit a handwritten document long form in the same expeditious way that I do on a, a laptop. So do you think it's possible that the ambition to maintain the manual practice of art could be kind of favoritism for one format over another? Gosh, these are good questions. Um, as you as you know, my brother is a, is a writer, so I, I've always known that we've had this parallel existence of, of he writing and me painting drawing whatever um and although he's written a few novels uh, and i know the, the struggle of writing a novel you would use whatever tool at your disposal to to get that novel into print i mean with a novel the, the, the finished result is the printed book isn't it and of course it's got multiple copies there's no point in having one that is the original yeah. novel and then the rest being copies the, the, the parallels with a painting there don't work but uh i don't think it's when you look at writers who before the typewriter would have had to write by hand uh, when the typewriter arrived it made it a little bit easier but you know going over your mistakes you're generally going to be ripping it out or um uh, uh, tipexing it out later on and then a word processor would have made it easier and then a computer even easier um i don't think i don't think with writing it, it's it's fair to say that uh, um there's any amount of cheating going on by using whatever means necessary to get that book out right. but uh w with painting and fine art wasn't it the case that photography was meant to be the death of painting when it yeah. came along? It was like, well, this is going to change everything. This is going to kill painting dead. And 
if anything, it enhanced it. It helped it. Uh, you know, we're still painting to this day. There's no sign that we're going to stop painting. Is it because we're painters and we're, we're denying progress? I, I don't think it is. I think people will still want to see the result of the hand of an artist on a canvas or a piece of paper. I, I just don't think you, you're going to get away from that. What about the virtual reality world? Um, and it's 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 kind of upcoming isn't it it's going to be upon us very soon uh, virtual reality headsets um do you think that that kind of future um where say you have a headset on and you have a you can see yourself as an avatar and you can paint but you're painting in a, in a virtual world um do you think that that experience is going to be it's going to equate at all to the, the fundamental physical experience of creating art. Well, I think it's a bit like this David Hockney thing. It's um, if you're talking about virtual reality as, uh, or even let's bring gaming into this because mm. uh, the gaming industry uses a lot of artists from everything from creating the, the, the characters you're playing with, say the, let's go a bit retro on this say the design that would have created sonic the hedgehog uh, and his little world or, or even the more complex worlds that are in the more um elaborate games out there today these are all done by artists but are they art um you know to some people yes surely they would be that there's a lot of crazy design skill that goes into creating some of these characters um but hand david hockney an ipad he's he's going to do stuff that you or i wouldn't be able to do so in this in this example art is by definition something that an artist creates um is it art if it's created by someone who doesn't call themselves an artist well possibly but it it, it most definitely is in the hands of david hockney um so the virtual reality thing could simultaneously be entertainment put out by the gaming industry uh, or if an artist does it with the intent of creating art it is art um, the, the the old breakdown of um, what constitutes art certainly the way we were taught it at art college we're, we're taken back to the marcel duchamp um, i think it was took the urinal turned it upside down signed it our oh, mutt and it became art so we were told at art college that art is whatever you decide is art or even better still if you take something and take away its original function you can turn it into art it becomes art the moment it stops being anything else um now i, I had to accept all that i was you know if i was taught it I, it was like well that must be the case but what i didn't realize back then was i was being brainwashed with postmodernism, yeah. and uh Postmodernism is the enemy of art, as far as I can see. It's what allows Tracy Emin to exhibit uh, an unmade bed or, or a tent she's had sex in and present it as art. Now, some of the these artists are, are talented in their own right. I mean, the Chapman brothers, for instance, they, yes. they, they're really quite good artists. And I love the stuff that they turn out. But uh, their massive tableau of... Um, little lead soldiers um committing all sorts of horrors uh it, it's a stretch to call it art but it's uh, i'm at a loss to describe what else it could be so postmodernism i wouldn't like to dismiss everything in there or, uh, altogether but it's it's the death of beauty and achievement and accomplishment and skill in art and uh it's <laughs> It's the slow march through the institutions of the art world, isn't it? It, yes. it, it it's what has become of art um, in comparison to, to everything else that's happened with the world, with education, with the church, with um, all our institutions, which have gradually fallen to the, their equivalents of of this evil that is postmodernism. Have you got any sense of what's going on in art colleges and schools today? Um. Yes, I, I've been going. I, I've been visiting the uh, 
at the exhibition at, at my local university's art department and as far as I can see is getting worse every year and what it shows to me is if they've got kids coming in who have skill they will leave having done some good stuff but they're not helping the kids who come in with average abilities they're not teaching them how to draw how to paint how to go through the basics they're allowing them to arrive on day one call themselves artists and effectively do what they want as long as they can talk nicely about it now i was still um doing life drawing classes drawing still life um i went through this process during my art degree at cheltenham art college in the um in the late 80s I remember part of the the first year course was we were put in front of a, a window. Uh, we had to draw that window, you, you know, measuring with your pencil and uh, scaling it against the uh, against your the piece of paper on the pad on your easel in front of you, and you had to draw that window. Then the next day, they'd stuck three dots on the window with um, you know, paper dots, and you had to then draw those dots into the right place, measuring them. And then they would stretch a piece of string across the window and pin that in, and you had to draw that. And you would find that if you hadn't drawn it correctly, the string line you are drawing wouldn't intersect the dots in quite the right way. So you were back to rubbing everything out, starting again, measuring correctly. It was all a process about learning how to correctly map what you see in front of you onto that piece of paper now it's not going to provide a satisfying lovely piece of art at the end of it but as an exercise in putting down what you see before you it was absolutely invaluable and a, and a really good lesson i can't see that sort of stuff being taught today uh, i don't see life drawing being done and um the basic skills are being ignored and they're doing a great disservice to the young artists coming through the 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 art colleges if they're all they're doing is brainwashing them with the idea that art is just something created by an artist then there is no hope for the future of art it, it's going to be it's going to be lost forever no and and if you went to college in the, in the late 80s and they were saying to you anything that you call art is art which is a to my mind a very arrogant statement um then how far have we come now and you know what, what sort of art has been produced in the meantime are there always going to be people like jonathan miles lee who um are outliers and traditionalists um or are they going to be swept up and consumed by the by this this postmodern washing out I think ultimately um, people like Jonathan will always be around because he, he didn't even go to art college. He, he, he did history of art. And uh, I think that the skills that he had, he, he honed at Malvern College where, where he was with me. We had a fantastic art department there, which was every bit as good as any art college I've been to. And, uh, you know, he, as I said before, if you have the skill, then an art college might help you learn your craft which which to some extent is a dirty word in itself to a to a fine artist equating fine art to a craft but learning your craft is really important it, it's everything from learning how to stretch a canvas to, to to mixing your colors and if you want to be really traditional grinding your own pigments and all that sort of stuff that that is your craft an art college should should be teaching you that and uh, i certainly don't think they're doing that but i think there will always be those who with or without art college will be producing jaw-droppingly good paintings because being a painter isn't something you choose to do it's a bit like being a writer you do it because you can't help it and uh, God gave you those particular skills and not others and try as you might you are drawn towards writing or art uh, my brother's had the same problem with with both his kids he was saying God's sake don't become writers it's such a struggle and sure enough they've both gone off to do English and uh, uh, it, I, I think it must be in the genes uh, they can't help themselves they will probably end up a, as wonderful writers but you don't go into it because it looks like it might make you a, a load of money you do it because you can't help it yeah I certainly feel that way about the, the bits and bobs that I do it's something innate in me it wasn't particularly encouraged by any family member I've got um, no one 
close to me to, to emulate and, and no teachers or tutors in the past. Um, and and the, the bits I have wrote, especially in my late 20s and 30s, were, um, you know, when I did show them to people, they just thought they were shit. And they still they would still say that to me now, but, but <laughs> it never really bothered me because I, I'm compelled to do it. Firstly, so it was something that I couldn't help doing or can't help doing, and and secondly, I get a kind of perverse buzz out of um, uh, out of any kind of um, critique, whether it be good or bad, towards what what I produce. Um, I wonder if so. I don't know if you feel the same or if or if many artists feel the same that they um, they don't mind the good press or the bad press. What do you think? Uh, I think a lot of us will always say that we like to be criticised, um, but it doesn't stop us wincing inwardly when we get criticism. And the, the, the very worst criticism for me is when someone picks up on something I've done and they are correct. Um, they, they found a shortcoming in a painting and I've been looking at it and I've been... There's, there's one on the painting I mentioned earlier um and i won't say the part that it is because it hurts me so much to even talk about it but every time i look at it i think you know i, I got that bit wrong uh, i wish i could go back and 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 fix it and and if someone comes along and says you know what that painting's great but that bit there doesn't look right i, I would just wince inwardly however if if i get criticized and someone says you know, I, I don't think it's very good i, I can't I, I can't put my finger on it but you know i don't like it I think people understand with artists that we are sensitive souls and it takes a brave person to 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 be brutally honest with an artist and, and tell them what they really think about a particular painting. Uh, and yet tell us it's wonderful and we'll roll over and have our tummy tickled like a cat. You know, it's uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yes, I like to be. I like to have people tell me what they think about my stuff, but I'd rather I'd rather it was all good. <laughs> Well, perhaps that um, that comes from the fact that you did have the um, the tutelage that that you did, and, and you were made to draw that window, and then and then the dots, and then how the the string intersected with the dots, and so you've built up this this cachet of of skill and, and technique, and when it lets you down, you're disappointed in yourself, and and I wonder if if that can translate to digital art, if if um, if you can get there quicker with digital art, then when you produce it and you get critique for it, is it going to hurt as much? Um, it, it's again, you're going to be talking about because so many people, more people can do digital art. It, it's uh, you, you'll be criticized by people who are going to be doing it themselves. I mean, it's still quite a, um, a, a, a small world the, the world of painters so I don't often hang out with other painters but uh, I'm always in a room full of people who can do a certain amount of digital art so uh, yeah it, it, it's it's so easy come easy go digital art isn't it but unless you're talking about people who do digital art for a living and, and they will be uh, I suppose a, a rare breed as well it, it, it's a tricky one because it is this democratization and the hands-on bit uh, I don't often encounter other other fine artists, so you know it's it's hard to tell. And so, are, are we saying that? Would you agree with the statement that art is a series of decisions? Yes, I think that's a really uh, it's a a really good way of putting it because when, when I'm trying to justify why. Um, my painting is unique. Why? What I said earlier about if someone else took the photos that I work from and and turned them into watercolors, they would be completely different. I'm not saying better or worse, but they would not look like the paintings I'm doing. So every time I'm looking at the photo and deciding how I recreate that in watercolor, that's a decision. Um, it, it, it's not a, an automatic process. I think with digital, the, the, the tendency is, I mean, you, you could be talking with digital about using a stylus and, and in the same way that I'm using a brush and, and achieving the same end. But so often you're talking about uh, 
copying and pasting. And a lot of people will assume if it's digital, you're, you're using the photograph literally. You're, you're just working over the top of a photograph. And a lot of cases you might. But certainly with a painting, you know that that, that can't be the case. It, it is. People understand everyone has had a go at painting um, at some point in their lives. It might just be finger painting in kindergarten or it might, they might have done it for their GCSEs. So everyone knows that it is quite a difficult thing to do well. So people quite like an artist in that respect. Quite often people say, oh, I'd love to be able to paint like that. I, I've tried painting, but uh, I'm rubbish at it. So by saying that, they're automatically revealing that they do understand what goes into making a painting. Uh, I think with digital art, it's just not the case. Yeah, I get that sense too. Um, I get the sense that the, the the fewer decisions that you have to make during the process of, of making the piece, the less value it has ultimately. Absolutely, to, yeah. To the artist and, and perhaps to the to the audience, and and that's that's my worry about digital art that um, people will be um, confused with by, w confused by the two that in, in that they'll think that um, a, a manual artist has what am I trying to say um, that a digital artist has has the same weight of value in, in their history of um, learning how to apply their trade than a digital artist has because the digital artist ultimately has that undo button and where where the manual artist and not one of the decisions they have to make is how to overcome a mistake as we spoke about earlier mm -hmm. and and when that mistake is the undo button then you know that's going to extract part of the the importance of, of the journey of making that piece from from the ultimate piece itself i think if you take a friend uh, who may or may not know much about art because um, you hear that expression a lot don't you or I don't know much about art but I know what I like and yeah. take someone like that into say the National Gallery and just walk them around and say look stop me when you see a painting that for whatever reason you really like and then try to tell me why you like that now there's going to be paintings in there that are essentially a massive canvas with a single uh, like two foot wide brush stroke on, you know, some some abstract expressionist stuff. Uh, they, they might be drawn to that. And they might say, look, it, it's really amazing. that This is just a splash of, of paint on a on a canvas and it passes as art. But more often than not, they're going to go up to an, a really elaborate painting. And the painting I have in mind here is Holbein's The Ambassadors. And I will Just go into the that for me, please. It's it's um, from the court of Henry the Eighth, and it's the two ambassadors side by side, um, and it's painted by Hans Holbein. It, it's a, a pretty large painting, mm. but these two men are in their robes and finery, and the uh, they're in em embroidery and furs and. All the textures are so beautifully realized and there's a table between them that's got globes and maps and manuscripts and um, navigational devices. And everything in it is painted to photorealistic standards. And you can go into that into the National Gallery, look at this painting and just soak it all in it, it is the, the most jaw-droppingly wonderful painting and it's painted in oh God, no, 15 whatever um and you just marvel at the skill that every brushstroke represents with that painting and you you, you ask yourself what were these guys like what what, mm. what sort of men were these ambassadors and you, you you're looking at the painting and you, you're assuming that the well, look, he's got this navigational sextant, so he, he he may well have been an explorer. And this man is world wise because he's holding this manuscript. And you just get drawn into the story, a bit like the Hogarth um, uh, paintings we were talking about earlier. Mm. Now, compare that to the painting that is essentially one waft of colour across the canvas. It's, which are you going to take uh, as a uh, as an uneducated in the world of art person? Uh, just a normal bloke who knows what he likes and likes what he sees. You're going to be drawn to the ambassadors for, for all that it's hundreds of years old. The amount of work and skill that's gone into that, 
that's what's going to get you. Yeah. And uh, you're going to be drawn to something where you say, wow, that must have taken a long time with a lot of skill. There's something that is never going to compete with that. Yeah, uh, I think we've, we've come full circle nicely when we were <clears throat> at the top of the podcast talking about the layers of human application um, that add to the, the ultimate wonder of the image. It, it's something about imagining the what the artist had to go through to get that in front of you that makes it even more powerful, certainly. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I get that with, uh, with, with Canalettos as well. I mean, I used to... I used to work on Baker Street uh, at Publicis, a big advertising agency. And uh, at lunchtime, I could go to the Wallace Collection, which is a fantastic gallery nearby. And it it was free to get in. And so I'd have a a, a lunch break and I'd grab a bagel somewhere, wolf it down. And that would be 10 minutes of my lunch break on. But the rest of it, I would spend wandering around this gallery. And uh, one of the most famous paintings in there is Franz Howell's The Laughing Cavalier. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in amongst all of the, all of the more famous paintings, and they've got some great antique armor and, and swords and helmets and stuff like that. So there's so much to see there. But they've got a room full of canalettos. And I'm just thinking this guy, he's so prolific, but the detail in these um, cityscapes, you know, these little figures running around and you know, scenes of Venice, uh, the, the, the color and the line and the, the painting every single window in. And you, you're just being drawn into these things and uh, you lose yourself in admiration for just how brilliant this guy was. And you look around the room and you think, well, this is only a fraction of this guy's output. And what an amazing person. Uh, you, you're not going to get that with digital, are you? you, you you're never going to compete. No, you, you aren't. And, and isn't it amazing that young art students and um, kids that want to be writers like, like James's kids, um, they, they look upon masterpieces and they read masterpieces, but it doesn't dissuade them. Uh, yeah, it, it's a funny thing. When, whenever I want inspiration as an artist, there's two things that will inspire me. One of them is going around an art gallery and seeing an amazing exhibition uh, by a really talented individual. The other thing is going around an exhibition by someone who is just rubbish. And then the, on the one hand, I think, God, I could never be this good, but I'm going to try. And on the other hand, it, you get a well, if this guy can get an exhibition, yeah. I'm better than that. I'm going to go home and, and, and do something about it. So, yeah, both both equally inspirational for me. OK, finally, Dick, um, what would or would the young Dick Dellingpole have gotten on board with digital art when he was at Malvern College in the late 80s? Um, I think so, because when you're young, you, uh, you're a, a neophile, aren't you? Everything mm. everything new is wonderful and exciting. And back then, I, I, I didn't see barriers. I just saw opportunities. So I think I would, you know, if, if computers were any more, I don't know if you remember the old BBC computers. That's yeah, what, I do, actually. That, that's what was in when I was at Malvern College. And uh, it was only the computer geeks who were getting them. So we were still a good 10 years away at that point from... Uh, from computers being genuinely accessible to artists. Uh, I mean, the Apple Mac was only a, uh, a gleam in um, in its creator's eye at the time. So, uh, um, had the Apple Apple Mac been around at the time I was at art college, I think things could have been very different. I, I might have embraced it wholeheartedly and ended up as a purely digital artist. And I would have probably be saying some very different things to you right now that favor the digital artist over the traditional artist. But uh, um, yes, I, I, I think I would have I would have embraced it. Yeah. So, so once again, it, it's it's up to the adults and, and the tutors and the teachers to um to display how many different ways you can you can ply a trade um, and what modern techniques are worth taking up and and the traditional techniques that even that might be defunct in some ways are certainly worth learning anyway 
Well, I would like to think that the foundation courses are doing that. I'd be interested to see what you do on a foundation course now, because, you know, the traditional setup was that before you go off and do your degree, you do a foundation course at your local art college and they, they you do a module of fashion, a module of ceramics, a module of, uh, uh, of um, sculpture, printmaking. Fine art is only one of the modules you'll turn your hand at. And then at the end of it, uh, as my fine art tutor, Ted Allen, said when I was at Bourneville School of Art, he, he was my fine art tutor. And he said he felt his job was to put people off doing a fine art degree, which was a, a really great way of uh, describing his role as the fine art tutor. But uh, it was only the absolute diehards who refused to take on something more commercial and say against all the odds they wanted to still try and be a traditional fine artist so i'd like to think that the uh, the foundation courses are giving people a, a good grounding in the options of digital art but i'd also like to know that um if you did still want to pursue a career doing traditional painting you still could yeah yeah as, as would i well thank you very much for talking to me today it's been great you're very welcome it's been fun i've learned a lot and i hope to speak to you again soon absolutely Thank okay. you, Annie. Cheers, Dick. Cheers.